Okay, we're moving into a new area of philosophy, uh, an area called philosophical theology, also sometimes called the philosophy of religion. Um, and this, um, this area will constitute the very last subject area that we will discuss in this course. Today, uh, I want to talk about the, the proofs for the existence of God um, the various proofs have been offered attempting to show that God uh, exists. And the first um, argument I want to talk about is the cosmological argument for God's existence. There are actually several uh, cosmological arguments for God's existence. Um, uh, I'm going to go over a few of them, only one of which, however, which I will identify, you will need to know for the final exam. But here's a definition of the cosmological argument for God's existence that you should write down because it will appear in some form on your final exam. Okay, the cosmological argument for God's existence, write it down. The cosmological argument for God's existence is the argument that the nature of the universe is such that it must be an effect of an unique being capable of creating it a being generally identified as God Okay, again, the cosmological argument for God's existence is the argument that the nature of the universe is such that it must be an effect of a unique being capable of creating it, a being generally identified as God. So basically, what it's saying is that God is the cause of the universe and the universe is the effect of God's act of creation. Sometimes this argument is called the argument from first cause. The argument turns on seeing the nature of the material of the universe as subject to change, as contingent, or that simply means dependent, and as finite, as limited. The argument dates back to Plato and was picked up and furthered by major monotheistic religions and a variety of philosophers. There are many different versions of the argument, and here's the argument that you will be responsible for on the final exam, so you need to write this down. This is the basic argument. It's the simplest version. Number one, everything that exists has a cause of its existence. Number two, the universe exists. Number three, therefore the universe has a cause of its existence. Number four, if the universe has a cause of its existence, then that cause is God.
And fifthly and finally, therefore God exists. Okay, so here's the argument again. Number one, everything that, that exists has a cause of its existence. The universe exists, obviously. Thirdly, therefore the universe has a cause of its existence. Fourthly, if the, if the universe has a cause of its existence, then that cause is God. And fifthly and finally, therefore God exists. Now many people have propagated uh, different versions of this argument over the years and we'll be talking about some of those versions. And many people uh, attribute a great deal of strength to, the, to this argument. But there have been people also who have come along and said so they've seen some problems with this argument. And let's talk about some of the so-called problems that exist about the cosmological argument. The first problem, alleged problem, if everything that exists has a cause, then an existent God must have a cause. Okay. If, however, God does not have a cause, then premise one is false and the argument is unsound. Remember, premise one was everything that exists has a cause of its existence. What well, it would seem to follow then, if, every, if everything that exists has a cause of its existence and God exists, then God has a cause of its existence. But if premise one is false and some things can exist that don't have a cause, then the universe itself could be something that exists without a cause. So if God could exist without a cause, then that means that there are some things that could exist without a cause. There's no reason to not think that the universe could exist without a cause. Another version, a more sophisticated version of the cosmological argument is called the contingency cosmological argument. And I will now give you that argument. Uh, you don't need to know it for the final exam, uh, but it is an interesting argument. Number one, everything that exists contingently has a necessary cause for its existence. Number two, the universe exists contingently. Number three, therefore the universe has a necessary cause for its existence. Fourthly, if the universe has a necessary cause for its existence, then that cause is God. And fifthly and finally, therefore, God exists. Now, what is meant by contingent things is simply things that could, that could fail to exist. The things that we create with our hands could conceivably not exist if we decided not to create them. You and I could conceivably not exist if our parents had never met. So our existence is contingent. The world we live on is contingent because it is conceivable that the universe could have developed in such a way that there were no planets at all. So something necessarily, so something necessarily must exist for contingent things to exist. The universe is a contingent thing, therefore it seems that, necessar <clears throat> that necessarily uh, something exists that must have caused it. And by necessarily existing, what we mean is 
it could not have failed to exist. What we mean by the necessary existing thing that caused all contingent things to exist is God. So these are the kind of underlying uh, ideas and assumptions of the argument. Um, <clears throat> Now I'm going to give some criticisms of the argument and then I'm going to come back and uh, give a reply made by those who believe in the conting contingency cosmological argument uh, to the criticism. So what could be wrong with this argument? Well, well it, might, it might be true that the form of each individual thing in the universe is contingent. It doesn't follow that the universe as a whole is contingent. In fact, the contingency cosmological argument arguably commits the fallacy of composition. If you remember from our lecture on um, logical fallacies, we talked about the fallacy of composition. It basically states what is true of the part must be true of the whole. So for example, if someone were to argue, just because a book of many chapters uh, has only chapters that don't amount to more than 25 pages, it follows the entire book is only 25 pages long, well that would be crazy. That would be wrong because it could be multiple chapters that uh, have um, 25 pages or less. So that's uh, how the fallacy of composition can be committed. So applying it to this argument, so just because the universe might be composed of contingent parts, it do doesn't follow that the universe as a whole is contingent. So the universe as a whole might be necessary. Now, the response to this criticism is to say that when we think of anything as being necessary, imagining its non-existence is impossible. Impossibilities are unthinkable, like thinking about a square circle. But imagining the non-existence of the universe as a whole is not impossible to conceive. Therefore, the universe must be contingent. So this is a reply that theists often make uh, to non-theists about the contingency cosmological argument. There's another um, cosmological argument that I want to discuss because it's much discussed today. It's called the column cosmological argument. This argument dates back to, to medieval Muslim philosophers Al-Kindi and Al-Ghazali. It has been recently picked up by monotheistic, monotheistic philosophers because of the Big Bang Theory. You know, the theory that the universe is all condensed into an infinitely small point and exploded and became all finite things. Well, one philosopher in particular today is the chief proponent of this argument. His name is William Lane Craig, and he's, this argument is much discussed on the web and elsewhere. Um, and the reason why this argument is so popular, as you'll see, is because the Big Bang Theory suggests that the universe has a beginning in time. Here's the argument. Number one, everything that has a beginning of its existence has a cause of its existence. Number two, the universe has a beginning of its existence. Number three, therefore the universe has a cause of its existence. Number four, if the universe has a cause of its existence, then that cause is God. 
Number five, therefore God exists. Now, William Lane Craig claims that whatever causes the universe to exist must have these attributes. It must be omnipotent, that means all-powerful. It must be a creator. It must be eternal. And it must not be dependent on anything for its existence. And anything that has these qualities or attributes, says William Lane Craig, must be a god. So that's basically the argument. There have been some criticisms of the argument. Now some of the replies that have gone on about the argument are highly complex scientific arguments. But here are some replies that are more easily understood. For example, just because everything that emerged from the Big Bang had a cause, it doesn't follow that the stuff that existed in a condensed form before the Big Bang had a cause. And then there's the argument, why must there be only one creator involved in creating the stuff of the Big Bang? Why not many creators taking a part? So that's a survey of some of the cosmological arguments uh, that have been offered. Now I want to talk about another argument um, that, um, <clears throat> that is often offered. It's called the teleological argument for God's existence. And let me now give you a definition of teleological arguments for God's existence uh, that will appear on your final exam. So write it down. Here it goes. Teleological arguments for God's existence are the argument that the universe and natural world show evidence of deliberate design of an intelligent creator. So again, the teleological arguments for God ex God's existence are the arguments that the universe and natural world show evidence of the deliberate design of an intelligent creator. Teleological arguments for God's existence are also called arguments from design. It comes from the Greek word teleos, which means purpose or end. Now versions of uh, the argument have, have been can be found in various holy books. For example, in the Old Testament, uh, Psalms 19.1, we read these words. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. And in the Quran, 31.20 asks this question. Do you not see that Allah has made what is in the heavens and what is in the earth subservient to you and made complete to you his favors outwardly and inwardly? The philosopher and theologian St. Thomas Aquinas used a version of the teleological argument in his work on the five ways of knowing that God exists. William Paley has the most famous version of, that, of this argument, and we'll be talking about that briefly. Today's version that is often offered forms what has been called the, called the intelligent design arguments. But let me give you a basic argument uh, for the teleological argument, and this argument will appear on your final exam. So you want to write it down. Okay, so the basic version of the teleological argument. Number one, human artifacts are products 
of intelligent design. Number two, the universe resembles human artifacts. Number three, therefore the universe is a product of intelligent design. Number four, but the universe is larger and more complex than human artifacts. Number five, Therefore, there is a very powerful and highly intelligent designer who created the universe. So again, the basic uh, version of the teleological argument goes like this. Number one, human artifacts, or things we create with our hands, are products of intelligent design. Number two, the universe resembles human artifacts. Thirdly, the universe is a product of intelligent design. Number four, but the universe is larger and more complex than human artifacts. Fifthly and finally, therefore, there is a very powerful and highly intelligent desire, designer who created the universe. Now, as I said before, the most famous version of the argument was given by a man by the name of William Paley, P-A-L-E-Y. Paley compared the universe to a watch. It has many parts uh, designed to work in harmony with other parts to further a purpose, which a watch does. Just as the complexity, order, and purpose of a watch implies intelligent design, argued Paley, so too the complexity, order, and purpose of the universe implies intelligent design. In short, it implies a God. The argument is thus an argument from analogy. It analogizes from human artifacts to the, a God who designs the universe. Okay. Now there have been various criticisms made of the teleological argument over the years. I'm going to give you some of those now. <clears throat> the first criticism was like this. Although the chances of a particular order of the universe, as it now is, is very small, even in a godless universe, the chances that some order would prevail is certain. So the fact that order exists in itself doesn't necessarily mean anything, this argument says. Because some order is going to exist. Now this particular order that exists, the chances of that are very, very small. But that would be true of any order of the universe that would exist. Secondly, <coughs> excuse me, the teleological argument trades on an understandable or beneficial order. In other words, things working out to serve some understandable or beneficial end. But what, but what about things that don't work out for understandable or beneficial ends? Accidents that cause great tragedy. 
explosions of stars and distant galaxies, galaxies colliding, black holes. What about here more locally, volcanoes, earthquakes, tidal waves? Do these prove disorder? And thirdly, the argument doesn't prove the existence of only one God. Uh, there could be several gods that uh, are, are responsible for the design of the universe, if it's designed at all. And fourthly, doesn't evolution eliminate the necessity of explaining the existence of beneficial biological characteristics as the product of design? So evolution basically would suggest, or some people would suggest, that evolution suggests that we don't need an intelligent designer. So that's the teleological argument. Let's now move on to another argument for God's existence called the ontological argument for God's existence. And ontological is spelled O-N-T-O-L-O-G-I C-A-L, ontological. The ontological arguments for God's existence attempt to show that God's existence is necessary if he is the most perfect being. In other words, it would be self-contradictory to deny God's existence. So whereas the cosmological and teleological arguments for God's existence relied on empirical evidence, the ontological argument relies only on how God is defined. Well, let me give you now a definition of the ontological argument that will appear on your final exam. So you need to write this down. The ontological argument for God's existence. The ontological argument for God's existence is an argument that claims to prove on logical grounds that God exists just from examining the concept of God. So again, <clears throat> the ontological argument for God's existence is an argument that is an argument that claims to prove on logical grounds that God exists just from examining the concept of God. The person who is credited with designing the ontological argument is a person by the name of St. Anselm, that's A-N-S-E-L-M. He was the Archbishop of Canterbury. He lived from 1033 to 1109. Here's the basic argument, the basic ontological argument, and you should write it down because it will appear on your final exam. So here it goes. Number one, <clears throat> it's impossible to think of a being greater than God. Number two, the greatest possible being either exists in the mind alone or exists in both mind and reality. Number three, but existing both in the mind and reality is greater than existing, than just existing in the mind alone.
Number four, therefore, the greatest possible being must necessarily exist in both the mind and reality. And fifthly and finally, therefore God exists. So here's the basic argument for the <clears throat> for the ontological argument. Again, number one, it's impossible to think of a being greater than God. Number two, the greatest possible being either exists in the mind alone or exists in both mind and reality. But existing both in the mind and reality is greater than existing just in the mind alone. Number four. Therefore, the greatest possible being must necessarily exist in both the mind and reality. And fifthly and finally, therefore, God exists. So basically what this argument is saying is that the greatest possible being that you can think of is God. What's greater? To exist just as a thought in the mind or to exist as a thought in the mind in also reality. Well, if God is the greatest possible being, then it, imp it, should, it implies necessarily, the argument claims, that God must exist both as a, as a thought in the mind, but also in reality, because that's, that's a greater achievement. So God must necessarily exist in both the mind and reality, and so therefore God exists. Now there have been other versions of the argument. One was given by Descartes, and we talked about that fairly recently, but we already examined it when we looked at epistemology. There are some very complex modern versions offered by Charles Hartsholm, Norman Malcolm, and Alvin Plantinga, contemporary philosophers, or fairly contemporary philosophers. So it's a very sophisticated argument and one that many people um, uh, believe in. In fact, I actually met a man one time who was a missionary and he claimed that he was sitting in a philosophy class in a university and didn't believe in God and uh, heard the ontological argument and became convinced of it, that it was correct. And so he switched his belief to believing in God and that one thing led to another and he eventually became a missionary. Now there's some criticisms that have been made of the ontological argument over the years. A contemporary of Anselm's, a monk by the name of Gonillo criticized the argument. First, he argued that if, An that if Anselm is correct, then all kinds of imaginary things would necessarily exist, like the greatest possible island, one that has no imperfections. Wouldn't it also, if it's the greatest possible island, have to exist both in the mind and also reality? Another example often used is one of the most perfect golden mountain. Secondly, he argued that the notion of the greatest possible being cannot be conceived by human beings. We can't think of the greatest possible being. God is just too great for human beings to adequately conceive of his greatness. 
St. Thomas Aquinas would later come along and echo a similar objection. The philosopher David Hume, whom we discussed before, criticized the ontological argument by arguing nothing can be proven to, to exist just by the use of reason alone. He said that whatever we can conceive of as existing, we can also can conceive as not existing. So there could be no logical impossibility about conceiving the non-existence of God. Another philosopher that we discussed in the course, Immanuel Kant, he criticized the argument. He argued that how something is defined doesn't necessarily entail its existence. I can define a triangle as having three sides, but just giving it a definition doesn't necessitate that a triangle must exist. Likewise, just because I can define God as the most perfect being, that doesn't imply that such a being must exist. Kant also argued that because God exists outside a perceptual experience in nature, it's not possible to know how one can prove God's existence. Okay, I'm going to divide this lecture up into two parts. This will be the first part and we'll do another recording for the second part, which is, uh, will be shorter. Thank you.